สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group, and we're studying Volume 11, which is titled "The Realms of Existence." We're going to be studying chapters 101 and 110 today. These are 10 chapters in this book that you can actually get access to, and you can read either before class or after class. You just go to BuddhaDailyWisdom.com. You'll be able to see the link for free books and be able to get access to the entire book series, which is titled "The Words of the Buddha: The Path to Enlightenment Revealing the Hidden." We've been studying these realms. Of existence for several weeks now, and the Buddha shared these teachings about the realms of existence for a reason. It's going to help you to be able to understand how the world is. You understand the cycle of rebirth and the five realms of existence. This way, if you are experiencing memories of your past lives, or you experience communication with beings from any of these realms, or you actually see beings from any of these realms. Then your mind can reside peaceful and joyful, understanding that there's nothing wrong and you're not going insane or anything like this. But this is completely normal to have memories of your past lives, to have communication with beings that are in any of these five realms, or to see any of the beings in any of these realms, whether it's hell or afflicted spirits or even the heavenly realm. These are formless beings; they don't have physical form, but you can actually see them for some people as your mind is awakening and lifting pollution out of the mind more and more. So I'd like to welcome you to our class today and invite you to join in our study group to be able to study the original words of the Buddha. We've got ten chapters that are going to be just kind of ending up our study of the heavenly realm, and then we've got a few chapters that we're studying the cycle of rebirth. So if you'd like to study with us, I'm going to display these chapters on the screen and then invite anybody who's in Zoom to be able to read the chapter. If you would like to read the chapter, you can read the chapter, and then I will share teachings on that. And then afterwards, I'll share. I'll open up to any and all questions that you guys might have. If nobody's interested in reading the chapters on Zoom, then I'll just go ahead and read them and then share teachings on that, and then open up to any questions that you guys might have. If you're interested in asking a question, you can ask those through Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, putting that into the comment section. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow-up questions directly. So this first chapter that we're going to be studying today is Chapter 101. This one is titled "The Heavenly Being's Good Destination." Monks, when a heavenly being is about to pass away from the company of heavenly beings. Five signs appear: his garlands wither, his clothes get soiled, sweat comes out of his armpits, a dullness descends on his body, he no longer excites in his own heavenly being seat. The heavenly beings, knowing from this that this heavenly being is about to pass away, encourage him with three sayings: "Go from here, honorable sir." To a good destination, having gone to a good destination, gain the gain that is good to gain. Having gained the gain that is good to gain, become well established. When this was said, a certain monk said to the perfectly enlightened one, "What, venerable sir, is the heavenly being's fate of going to a good destination? What is their fate of the gain that is good to gain? What is their fate of becoming?" Well established, the human state, monks, is the heavenly being's fate of going to a good destination. Having become a human being, acquiring conviction in the teachings and discipline taught by the Tathagata, this is the heavenly being's fate of the gain that is good to gain. When that conviction is settled within one, rooted, established, and strong, not to be destroyed by any Brahmin or ascetic. Heavenly being, Mara or Brahman or God or anyone else in the world, this is the heavenly being's fate of becoming well established. When a heavenly being passes away from the company of heavenly beings, though through his lifespan ending, three sounds sound forth: the heavenly being's encouragement, "Go from here, honorable sir, to a good destination." To companionship with human beings, on becoming a human being, acquire a conviction unsurpassed in the true teachings. That conviction of yours in the true teachings, well taught, should be settled, rooted, established, undestroyed as long as you live. 
having abandoned bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, mental misconduct, and whatever else is flawed, having done with the body what's skillful and much that is skillful with speech, having done that having done what's skillful with a heart without limit, with no material gain, then having made much of the merit that's a ground for spontaneous arising in heaven through giving established other morals, other mortals in the true teachings in the holy life. With this sympathy, the heavenly beings, when they know a heavenly being is passing away, encourage him, come back, heavenly being, again and again. Okay, so here we're getting some information from the Buddha about the heavenly realm. And we've been studying many chapters over the last couple of weeks about the heavenly realm. And he's helping us to understand what transpires in the heavenly realm. Here he's talking about how a heavenly being dies and kind of the indications that this is about to occur. And the Buddha talks about once a heavenly being dies, that they go to a good destination. Oftentimes people think about a heavenly being being in heaven, like this must be the best, most ultimate existence to be in the heavenly realm. But as I've shared before, it's actually the human realm, which is the most ideal realm because the heavenly beings tend to be complacent. They're still stuck in the cycle of rebirth. And here you're going to see in a moment where the Buddha talks about how heavenly beings are more likely to be reborn into hell, the animal realm or the afflicted spirit realm, into the lower realm. They're less likely to be reborn into the human realm and the heavenly realm, but they're more likely to be reborn into those lower realms because they haven't gotten to enlightenment. Heaven isn't a permanent ex existence. So here the Buddha is talking about this good destination. Well, what is that good destination? To be in the human realm. He talks about this here, that it's the human state that is that good destination. That's where you can actually have built-in motivation to get to enlightenment. Because in the heavenly realm, they only experience pleasant feelings, so they tend to not have motivation to be able to get to enlightenment. But here in the human realm, we experience not only pleasant feelings, but painful feelings and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant in the human realm. And as an unenlightened being, that can be built-in motivation for you to then get to the enlightened mental state because those painful feelings are uncomfortable and an individual is interested in getting away from those and moving beyond them. And that can be the motivation to help you decide to get to enlightenment. And then the Buddha says, okay, once one is established in the true teachings and getting into this human realm, then nobody can take that away from you. Nobody, not even Mara or any Brahmin or aesthetic or God can take that away from you because you're well established in this human realm with the conviction of looking to be able to get to enlightenment. So you can use those painful feelings as a way to motivate you to get to enlightenment, being dedicated, determined, and diligent to practice and train the mind. So let me know what questions you guys have on this chapter. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. Okay, Mayuli is asking a question here on Facebook. Does heavenly being age or they stay the same until they pass away? They do age and uh, they have a very long lifespan where they can live for multiple eons. And the Buddha is going to share a teaching with you in the set of teachings that we have today, which is describing how long an eon in how long an eon is, which is essentially an immeasurable amount of time, but they do have a certain lifespan. The lifespan that I remember, which is kind of the shortest of a heavenly being, is kind of like around 500 years, but they are oftentimes existing for much longer than that, for multiple eons. So they do age, but uh, they have an extended amount of time well beyond what a human being has. Let's see, okay, I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere. So let's go to chapter 102. Here, this one is titled, Beings are few who are reborn among heavenly beings or humans, human beings, because they have not seen the Four Noble Truths. What do you think, monks, which is more, the little bit of soil in my fingernail or the great earth? Venerable sir, 
The great earth is more. The little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is insignificant. Compared to the great earth, the little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is not calculable, does not bear comparison, does not even amount even to a fraction. So too, monks, those beings are few who, when they pass away as heavenly beings, are reborn among the heavenly beings. But those beings are more numerous who, when they pass away as heavenly beings, are reborn in hell, in the animal realm, in the realm of afflicted spirits. For what reason? Because, monks, they have not seen the Four Noble Truths. What for? The Noble Truth of Discontentedness, the Noble Truth of the Cause of Discontentedness, the Noble Truth of the Elimination of Discontentedness, the Noble Truth of the Way Leading to the Elimination of Discontentedness. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to understand. This is discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the cause of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the elimination of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. What do you think, monks, which is more, the little bit of soil in my fingernail or the great earth? Venerable sir, the great earth is more. The little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is insignificant. Compared to the great earth, the little bit of soil that the perfectly enlightened one has taken up in his fingernail is not calculable, does not bear comparison, does not even amount even to a fraction. So too, monks, those beings are few who, when they pass away as heavenly beings, are reborn among human beings. But those beings are more numerous who, when they pass away as heavenly beings, are reborn in hell, in the animal realm, in the realm of afflicted spirits. For what reason? Because, monks, they have not seen the Four Noble Truths. What for? The Noble Truth of Discontentedness, the Noble Truth of the Cause of Discontentedness, the Noble Truth of the Elimination of Discontentedness, the Noble Truth of the Way Leading to the Elimination of Discontentedness. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to understand. This is discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the cause of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the elimination of discontentedness. An effort should be made to understand. This is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. So here, this is the chapter that I was referencing that the Buddha is sharing that once somebody is in the existence of a heavenly being and they pass away from there, it's very rare that they're reborn back into the heavenly realm or back into the human realm. They're more likely to be reborn down into the lower realms where the Buddha shares right here that they're more likely to be reborn into hell, the animal realm, or afflicted spirits. So some people that are in the Buddhist community or even people who aren't practicing these teachings, they really aspire to be in the heavenly realm. They really want to be in that heavenly realm. They may have a desire, a longing and yearning for that, but that is not ideal because more likely than not, when you pass away from that existence, you're going to be reborn into the lower realms. And because beings in the heavenly realm are quite complacent, they oftentimes are reborn. So the ultimate goal would be to use this human existence to get to enlightenment. This is the ideal existence. And the reason why beings in the heavenly realm are oftentimes reborn into the lower realms and they're not reborn into the heavenly realm or the human realm is because they haven't understood the Four Noble Truths. It's the Four Noble Truths that helps you establish right view. This is where you have a breakthrough to finally understanding what's causing your discontent feelings so that you can eliminate them. The Buddha shares that anybody who dies with wrong view is reborn into hell, the animal realm, or afflicted spirits. And the Four Noble Truths is what establishes right view. By deeply understanding and practicing the Four Noble Truths, you have right view where you can deeply see that your mind is causing your own discontent feelings. And now, with that right view, you can make a real effort towards eliminating those discontent feelings through learning and practicing the Eightfold Path. But if you haven't seen the Four Noble Truths as the Buddha is describing here, 
then you have no way to establish right view. You might blame other people for the discontent feelings that are occurring in the mind. So as you develop more and more of right view and you establish that, you can see more and more that your mind's causing these discontent feelings. Then you can at least ensure that because of you having right view, there's less of a chance that you'll be reborn into hell, the animal realm, or afflicted spirits. But beings who don't see these Four Noble Truths, they will be reborn into those lower realms. And this is why the Buddha shares that if you have people in your life that you have compassion for, that it would be helpful if you made an effort to help them to understand the Four Noble Truths. And that might be nowadays sending them a link to a video or giving them a book as a gift or sending them a link to a podcast. This can be a way to introduce the Four Noble Truths to somebody. They're going to have to decide whether or not they actually learn them or not. But you can make the effort to share it with them. This is another teaching that the Buddha shares. Ultimately, what this path is all about is you getting to enlightenment and you training your mind. But as you do that and you see the beings around you really suffering and having real struggles and difficulties, you can try once or twice or maybe three times over a period of time to kind of send them a link here or there to maybe help them so they can see and understand the Four Noble Truths. Let me know what questions you guys have on this chapter. You can put it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Chrissy's asking a question here in Zoom. She says, when you say it's more often that they're not, that it's more often than not that humans go to the lower realms when they pass, I wonder if it will always be like this, or if in time with sharing these teachings, that might change. Yes, the more that these teachings are introduced into the world, and the more pervasive that more and more people learn these teachings, then people can escape this whole cycle of rebirth. But without these teachings being prevalent in the, in the world, and at the time that a Buddha comes into the world, the world's going to be at a low point where the teachings aren't really understood by hardly anybody in the world. So a Buddha, here the Buddha describing what is the situation during his life, is that heavenly beings are, and also human beings that he shares in other discourses are more likely to be reborn into hell, the animal realm, and afflicted spirits because when a Buddha arises, the world's going to be at a low point. And there's not very many people that understand the teachings. But then as a Buddha brings the teachings into the world more and more brightly, more and more vibrantly, and they spread during the lifetime of a Buddha and after a Buddha's death, then yes, it'll be more and more likely that people will have an opportunity to see the Four Noble Truths and then either get to enlightenment in this life or perhaps be reborn in the heavenly realm and get to enlightenment from there as a non-returner in the third stage of enlightenment. So that's the whole goal of a Buddha is to bring the teachings into the world in such a way that they can really shine and countless people can get access to them. And then this is what's going to help them escape the discontentedness in this life, but then also escape the cycle of rebirth so that they're not continually being reborn over and over and over again. Great question, Chrissy. Okay, let me see if we have any online as well. Yeah, you're welcome, Chrissy. Pleased to help you. Okay, I don't see any questions online anywhere else. So let's go to chapter 103. This is where we're now transitioning from the chapters that we've been studying for several weeks about the heavenly realm into the cycle of rebirth itself. So far in this book, we've covered the hell realm, the animal realm, the uh, afflicted spirit realm, the human realm, and now the heavenly realm. And now the Buddha is going to be teaching about the cycle of rebirth itself. So this first chapter in this section is chapter 103, which is titled A Simile of an Eon, First Discourse. Venerable Sir, how long is an eon? An eon is long, monk. It is not easy to count it and say it is so many years or so many hundreds of years or so many thousands of years or so many hundreds of thousands of years. Then, is it possible to give a simile, venerable sir? It is possible, monk, the perfectly enlightened one said. Suppose, monk, there was a great stone mountain a yojana long, which is 12 to 15 kilometers long, a yojana wide, a yojana high, 
without holes or crevices, one solid mass of rock. At the end of every hundred years, a man would stroke it once with a piece of Cassian cloth. That great stone mountain might be that's that great stone mountain might by this effort be worn away and eliminated, but the eon would still not have come to an end. So long is an eon monk, and of eons of such length, we have wandered through so many eons, so many hundreds of eons, so many thousands of eons, so many hundreds of thousands of eons. For what reason? Because, monk, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. Okay, so the first part of this discourse, a student of the Buddha is asking him to describe how long an eon is. And the Buddha is saying, oh, it's so long, it's really hard to explain how many years an eon actually is. The Buddha describes in other teachings that it's incalculable, it's uh, immeasurable, that you can't really measure how long an eon is. So then the student says, well, is it possible to give a simile to explain how long an eon is? And the Buddha says, yes, it is. He says, if there's this mountain that is essentially 12 to 15 kilometers long, 12 to 15 kilometers high, and 12 to 15 kilometers wide, this is a significant amount of, of a mountain. And he says, if this is a solid stone, and once every hundred years, somebody would rub that once with a cloth, that that mountain would wear away, but the eon would still be going on. This is a way to say that it's such a long, enormous amount of time. As far as I understand, during the lifetime of the Buddha, the highest number that they could count to was about 100,000. The number million, billion, trillion, those weren't invented until like the last 500 years or so uh, that these numbers came about. So a eon to the individuals that existed during the lifetime of the Buddha was like an unfathomable amount of time. Well, we've kind of figured out through science that this earth that we inhabit it has existed for about 4.5 billion years. 4.5 billion years is what they think. Now, some scientists say one uh, number, other scientists say another number because of impermanence, but generally about 4.5 billion years. We can't even fathom how long that is. Like We can count it, but our lifespan here on earth is somewhere between 60 to 100 years typically. That's a blink of an eye compared to 4.5 billion years. So it's understandable that during the lifetime of the Buddha, they could think about time as being incalculable, that an eon is just an enormous amount of time. And the reason why a student is asking the Buddha this is because he frequently would refer to the lifespan of a heavenly being or other beings as being one eon or three eons or 20 eons or something like this. And this is just like an immeasurable amount of time. Well, the other thing that the Buddha is sharing here about the cycle of rebirth is that the beginning of the cycle of rebirth is undiscoverable. And this is helpful for you because oftentimes in an individual's mind who's unenlightened, they might have this longing, this yearning, this craving, this desire to know when did the world start? When did everything get started? And as I mentioned, we can kind of trace through science at this present time and we think that the earth was here for 4.5 billion years, but that doesn't say how long the universe or the galaxy or the cycle of rebirth has been in existence. The cycle of rebirth, what the Buddha is saying is it's undiscoverable. And this is actually helpful because sometimes people's minds get preoccupied or almost obsessed with trying to figure out how long this world has been here and how long have we been in the cycle of rebirth. And the Buddha is saying it's undiscoverable. You can't figure it out. 
because none of us were there at the time, we don't actually know. So it's best to understand that and then just let it be because whatever happened in the past and all the countless rebirths that you've experienced, they're in the past. Right now, you're in the human state, you're able to get to enlightenment, you can train your mind and, and focus on that. Rather than worrying about how long we've all been around, the fact is, is that you're here now and you need to get to enlightenment because your mind's discontent. And if you don't get to enlightenment, your mind's going to continue to experience those discontent feelings over and over and over again, and you'll experience the cycle of rebirth as well. So the Buddha is explaining here that it's been for such a long time that you've experienced discontentedness, misery, disaster, and swelled the cemetery. What this is, is like you've taken up so many bodies, so many countless bodies that you've swelled the cemetery. And he talks in other teachings about how many countless rebirths that you've experienced. You're going to see that here in a moment. And what he's saying is, okay, don't worry about when the beginning of the cycle of rebirth started because it's enough to just get to enlightenment, to experience the fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions. It's enough to become free from strong feelings towards them. It's enough to be liberated from those strong feelings. So who cares when the cycle of rebirth started? Get to enlightenment and enjoy the peace and the joy of the enlightened mental state. That's what's going to produce the beneficial results now. And that's enough by you getting to enlightenment. Your mind will be fully fulfilled and fully satisfied is essentially what he's saying. Don't worry about when the cycle of rebirth started because it's undiscoverable. We can't figure it out. So let me know what questions you guys have on this one. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. So Yosef has a question here. He's saying, about the heavenly realm, if I will be reborn in it, will I be aware of my past lives? Will not, as I am right now, not aware? And will I fully remember them just blinks? Everybody's different. Not everybody's going to experience the recall of past lives. That's true here in the human realm, and it's true in the heavenly realm as well. So I wouldn't be able to tell you that you would be able to or you wouldn't be able to because it's impermanent. Not everybody's going to see their past lives. There's the potential that you would, but it's not guaranteed. Okay, so I don't see any more questions here. So let's move on to chapter 104. This is another simile of an eon. This is the second discourse. Venerable sir, how long is an eon? An eon is long, monk. It is not easy to count it and say it is so many years or so many hundreds of years or so many thousands of years or so many hundreds of thousands of years. Then is it possible to give a simile, venerable sir? It is possible, monk, the venerable, the perfectly enlightened one said. Suppose, monk, there was a city with iron walls, a yojana long, a yojana wide and a yojana high, filled with mustard seeds, as dense as a top knot. A top knot is the way they used to do their hair. They would bring it around and create this little knot on the top of their head, very compact and very tight. At the end of every hundred years, a man would remove one mustard seed from there. A great heap of mustard seeds might, by this effort, be depleted and eliminated, but the eon would still not have come to an end. So long is an eon, monk, and of eons of such length, we have wandered through so many eons, so many hundreds of eons, so many thousands of eons, so many hundreds of thousands of eons. Because, monk, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. So this is essentially the same discourse with just a different simile here. What he's saying is basically if there's this big box, you know, a city, 
that is 12 kilometers wide, 12 to 15 kilometers wide, 12 to 15 kilometers long, 12 to 15 kilometers high. And there's these walls that essentially create this big box and there's mustard seeds. Mustard seeds are very, very tiny. So an enormous amount of mustard seeds. And he's saying if a man every hundred years would take one mustard seed out, he says, okay, this great heap of mustard seeds would be depleted, but the eon would still be going on. So that's just an enormous amount of time that the Buddha is talking about here. So I suspect you guys don't have questions on this because you didn't have questions on the last one either. Uh, but all of this other stuff is exactly the same as I described earlier. So I'll move on to the next one, which is chapter 105. Here the title is, The Cycle of Rebirth is Without Discoverable Beginning, First Discourse. Venerable Sir, how many eons have elapsed and gone by? Monks, many eons have elapsed and gone by. It is not easy to count them and say they are so many eons or so many hundreds of eons or so many hundred or so many thousands of eons or so many hundreds of thousands of eons. But is it possible to give a simile, venerable sir? It is possible, monks, the perfectly enlightened one said. Suppose there were four disciples here, each with a lifespan of a hundred years, living a hundred years, and each day they were each to remember a hundred thousand eons. There would still be eons not yet remembered by them when those four disciples each with a lifespan of a hundred years, living a hundred years, would pass away at the end of a hundred years. It is not easy to count them and say that there are so many eons or so many hundreds of eons or so many thousands of eons or so many hundreds of thousands of eons. For what reason? Because, monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering, on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. So here, the question is slightly different. Instead of them asking the Buddha, how long is an eon? They're asking them, how many eons have gone by in the past? Like how much time has transpired in this world to the point where they were 2,500 years ago? You know, we think about 2,500 years ago as just being such a long time ago. But if you think about the entire history of the world in terms of this earth being 4.5 billion years, 2,500 years ago was nothing. That's also just a blink of an eye, truly. So here, the people during that time frame were trying to figure out how much time has transpired in the past because they didn't know. Nowadays, science tells us that there's been about 4.5 billion years of this Earth, but that doesn't say anything about the galaxy or the universe or this cycle of rebirth that the Buddha is describing. So the Buddha is saying that there's been countless eons that have occurred prior to the time frame that they were living in. And that would be true now too, according to what the Buddha is teaching. So let me know if you guys have questions on this one. Okay, Yosef is submitting more information. I'm not sure if this is the same question or different. So if not everyone will have the chance to be in one line with their past lives, I'm not aware of my past lives. Therefore, in this life, I'm a new guy from who I was in the past life, and we are. We are not connected, so why would one have a craving to be born in the heavenly realm if he will not be the same person with the same thoughts in the same body? So right now, at this present time, you don't have memories of your past lives, and that's just where you are at this present time. As you lift out more and more of the pollution out of your mind, you may experience the memories of your past lives. You don't necessarily know that right now. But all these beings are experiencing continuous rebirth. It's a new being every single time, but it's one causing condition that leads to the next. So 
I don't advise somebody to have a craving to be reborn in the heavenly realm. That's what you're saying is why would someone have a craving to be reborn in the heavenly realm? Well, the reason why is because of the unknowing of true reality. The reason why craving and anger continues in the mind is because of ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. What some people believe, and with belief you don't know what's true or false, you don't know the truth, that some people believe that if they die in this life, they only get one life, they go to heaven and they stay there for the rest of their life, that it's, it's eternal, that it's an eternal uh, existence. But that is the lack of wisdom. And because of that lack of wisdom, there can be somebody in this life now that has craving to be reborn in the heavenly realm. That craving is coming from the ignorance. If it wasn't for ignorance, craving wouldn't exist. So when you understand what the Buddha is teaching you, yeah, you can extinguish any craving to be reborn into the heavenly realm. And that's one of the things that you're going to need to do in order to get to enlightenment. If you have a craving to be reborn in the heavenly realm, you won't be able to experience enlightenment. So you're going to need to eliminate any craving that may or may not exist in order to get to uh, enlightenment. Okay, <clears throat> I'm not seeing any more questions. So let's go to chapter 106. The cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning, second discourse. Master Gautama, how many eons have elapsed and gone by? Brahman, many eons have elapsed and gone by. It is not easy to count them and say they are so many eons or so many hundreds of eons or so many thousands of eons or so many hundreds of thousands of eons. But is it possible to give a simile, Master Gautama? It is possible, Brahman, the perfectly enlightened one said. Suppose, Brahman, the grains of sand between the point where the river Ganges originates and the point where it enters the great ocean. It is not easy to count these and say there are so many grains of sand, or so many hundreds of grains, or so many thousands of grains, or so many hundreds of thousands of grains. Brahmin, the eons that have elapsed and gone by, are even more numerous than that. It is not easy to count them and say that they are so many eons, or so many hundreds of eons, or so many thousands of eons, or so many hundreds of thousands of eons. So then we get the same details from the previous uh, discourses that the Buddha is explaining all those same exact things. So here we just have another simile to explain how many eons have transpired from the time that they were in history to prior to that. And the Buddha is relating it to the grains of sand. And you can imagine from this entire river that there's so many grains of sand. And the Buddha is saying there was more eons than that that transpired uh, prior to the time frame that they were living. Okay, so you guys didn't have any questions on the last chapter. So I suspect you don't have any on this one either. So now we'll go to 107. Beings roaming and wandering on through this beginningless cycle of rebirth. Monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. One person roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, would leave behind a stack of bones, a heap of bones, a pile of bones, as large as this Mount Vupula. If there were someone to collect them, and what is collected would not perish. For what reason? Because, monks, the cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions, enough to, be, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. This is what the perfectly enlightened one said. Having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, further said this. The heap of bones one person leaves behind with the passing of a single eon would form a heap as high as a mountain. So said the great sage. This is declared to be a massive, this is declared to be as massive 
as the tall Vupala Mountain, standing north of Vulture Peak in the Magahana Mountain Range. But when one sees with correct wisdom the truce of the Noble Ones, discontentedness and its cause, the elimination of discontentedness and the Eightfold Path that leads to discontentedness calming, then that person, having wandered on for seven more times at most, makes an end to discontentedness by destroying all the fetters. So here the Buddha is saying how many countless rebirths an individual has had because of all this heap of bones that one would have collected over multiple lifetimes. And then he's saying, okay, once you see the truths of the teachings on the path to enlightenment, you can make a complete end to discontentedness by destroying all the fetters. That is eliminating the 10 fetters. That's how you get to enlightenment and eliminate the discontentedness and experience the enlightened mental state. So let me know what questions you guys have here. <clears throat> okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So now we'll go to chapter 108. I'm going to take a little sip of water. Okay, this one is titled, The Long Course in the Cycle of Rebirth. Monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. Suppose, monks, a man would cut up whatever grass, sticks, branches, and foliage there are in this jumble. We can't pronounce this. This is like uh, one of the great continents. A and collect them together into a single heap. Having done so, he would put them down, saying, for each one, this is my mother, this is my mother's mother. The sequence of that man's mothers and grandmothers would not come to an end, yet the grass, wood, branches, and foliage in this area would be used up and exhausted. For what reason? Because, monks, the cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning, a a first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. Monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing a true reality, and fettered by craving. Suppose, monks, a man would reduce this great earth to balls of clay the size of jujuba kernels, which are six millimeters or a quarter inch long, and put them down, saying for each one, This is my father. This is my father's father. The sequence of that man's fathers and grandfathers would not come to an end, yet this great earth would be used up and exhausted. For what reason? And then this is the same thing that we keep hearing over and over and over again. So what the Buddha is doing here is he's giving you another simile to help you understand how extensive amount of rebirth you've experienced over countless, countless, countless times, using a simile of all the branches and foliage being broken up, and also using the earth, if the earth was broken up, that each time you lay down a ball of clay or a branch, this represents one of your mothers or one of your fathers, and the Buddha is saying, okay, all that stuff would be used up, and you would still have more parents that you would need to account for. So there's just a countless number of rebirths where you've had multiple mothers and multiple fathers countless, countless, countless times. Okay, so here you're getting the same picture that the Buddha is describing and just about how many rebirths you've experienced. And this is why you got to convince yourself that, okay, put in the effort. You know, you've, you've been exhausted continuously going through this cycle of rebirth over and 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 over again. When you have a problem in your life, Sometimes you're experiencing the same problem 
over and 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 over again because you haven't cultivated the wisdom and you haven't made a decision to remedy that issue. So rather than keep experiencing it over and over again in this life, in all your previous lives and future lives to come, put an end to it by cultivating wisdom, making wise decisions and overcoming those obstacles so you're not just experiencing the same unwholesome results over and over and over and over again. So here, this is chapter 109. It's titled, Not Easy to Find Unrelated Beings in This Long Course of the Cycle of Rebirth. Monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. One person roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. It is not easy, monks, to find a being who in this long course has not previously been your mother. For what reason? Because, monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings towards all conditions, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. Monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. It is not easy, monks, to find a being who in this long course has not previously been your father. Okay, so then the Buddha continues on explaining all the same things. And he says, it's not easy to find someone who's previously been your brother, right? And then he says, okay, your sister. That it's not easy in this long cycle of rebirth to find someone who hasn't previously been these relatives. It's not easy to find someone who hasn't previously been your son. It's not easy to have found someone who has been previously your daughter, Okay, so what he's explaining here in this discourse is that when you come in contact with another being, even though you've never met that being in this life, whether it's a human, whether it's an animal, he's saying that it's almost impossible to encounter a being who hasn't previously been your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or some other relative. And if you cultivate this in the mind, you can go out into the world, instead of viewing people as strangers, view them as family members, someone that you haven't met yet. Because one of the things you're doing on the path to enlightenment is you're changing your perspective. If your mind's been conditioned that strangers are bad and you shouldn't talk to strangers and strangers are out to hurt you, you might be very depleted in terms of like the way that you walk around the world. You might be kind of scared or hesitant or shy to talk to other people because you think some harm is going to come about. But if you understand the natural law of gamma, that harm is only going to come to you when you cause harm, then you can go out into the world and think of people as your family members. And this can be wonderful when you go to a restaurant and you have a food server waiting on you, when you have a taxi driver, when you have somebody helping you, or when you're just walking in an airport somewhere. If you think about all these beings that you interact with as being your relatives, it can help you to arise loving kindness and compassion. If you see a spider in your house, think about that as your mother. So don't just walk over and kill it, relocate it outside. That would be the best way to do that. So if you start thinking about all these beings around you as previously being your relatives, not only can you understand that the cycle of rebirth has been long and countless, but also you can arise this loving kindness and compassion when you're interacting with other beings and change your perspective to no longer look at it as people are strangers and they're out to get you, but just look at it as family members that you haven't met yet. This way you can be smiling and you can be cheerful with everyone wherever you go in the world. And this is what I experience here in Thailand that I see the Thai people referring to people as mother and father and brother and sister, even people they've never met before. When I go into restaurants and I see people on the street, if I see a taxi driver, I will call him uncle or I might call him grandpa. Or if, I, if it's a woman, I might call her mom or aunt or grandma or something like this. And I refer to them that way. And it really creates a warm atmosphere. And here I do that in Thai, in Thailand. But even when I travel, when I go to places like America or 
I went to Egypt a couple years ago. In my mind, I think about everybody that I interact with as being a family member. And in this way, I can be loving and kind and compassionate and friendly and polite and respectful to everybody and anybody in the world because these are just my family members that I haven't met before. So you might decide to do this as well, where in your country, if you walked around and started referring to people as mom and dad, people might think that you're a little bit crazy. But at least if you think this in your mind, it can help you arise this loving kindness and compassion. It can change your perspective away from thinking of people as strangers. So let me know what questions you guys have here. Remember, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Let's see, Chrissy just saying that uh, she can read the next chapter. Okay, thank you, Chrissy. Let me see if I have any questions coming in anywhere. And then we'll move on to that next chapter. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So yeah, we have this last chapter, chapter 110. If you'd like to read this one, Chrissy, just feel free to open up your mic. Okay. A stream of tears. Monks. This cycle of rebirth is without discoverably, discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. What do you think, monks? Which is more, a stream of tears that you have shed as you roamed and wandered on through this long course, crying and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable. This is the water in the four great oceans. This is this or the water in the four great oceans. As we understand the teachings taught by the perfectly enlightened one, Venerable Sir, the streams, the stream of tears that we have shed as we roam and wander through this long course, crying and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable. This alone is more than the water in the four great oceans. Good, good monks. It is good that you understand the teachings taught by me in such a way. The stream of tears that you have shed as you roam and wander through this long course, crying and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable. This alone is more than the water in the four great oceans. For a long time, monks, you have experienced the death of a mother. As you have, as you have experienced this, crying and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, the stream of tears that you have shed is far more than the water in the four great oceans. For a long time, monks, you have experienced the death of a father, the death of a brother, the death of a sister, the death of a son, the death of a daughter, the loss of relatives, the loss of wealth, loss through illness. As you have experienced this, crying and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, the stream of tears that you have shed is more than the water in the four gray oceans. For what reason? Because monks, this cycle of rebirth is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not identifiable of beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving. For such a long time, monks, you have experienced discontentedness, misery, and disaster, and swelled the cemetery. It is enough to experience fading away of strong feelings toward all conditions, enough to become free from strong feelings towards them, enough to be liberated from them. All right. Thank you, Chrissy. So the Buddha is giving you a description of what we've experienced in this countless cycle of rebirth and this, you know, beginningless cycle of rebirth where there's just been countless rebirths. And he's talking about the tears that you've cried throughout all these lifetimes is more water than all the water in all the seas, essentially. Well, you can take the word of the Buddha on that, but you can also think about this life. If you've had a certain amount of tears that you've cried in this life, 
what the Buddha is helping you to see is, hey, you've been here, you've done that. You've done enough crying. You've done enough misery and despair and frustration and agitation. Take the time and the effort to become dedicated and diligent to learning and practicing the path so that you can escape all that discontentedness, all that misery, all that sorrow, all that grief and despair. So if you can visualize all the water and all the seas, if you've ever done scuba diving or you've ever been out on a boat, it's an enormous amount of water in the world. And the Buddha is saying, okay, you've cried more than this. So whether it's that amount of water or the amount of water that you've even cried in this life, if you've had a very turbulent, very difficult life and you've done a certain amount of crying, the Buddha is saying, okay, you've been there, you've done that. Now become dedicated and diligent, get beyond this. And the reason why the mind is experiencing that sorrow and the grief and displeasure is the Buddha is saying is that you're united with the disagreeable and you're separated from the agreeable. This is because of the craving, that if you have a craving, you'll get pleasant feelings when you have the agreeable contact. But when you have disagreeable contact, you'll experience painful feelings. So if you're united with the disagreeable, that means you're getting the things that you don't want and you're separated from the things that you want. And the Buddha is saying, this is the reason why you keep experiencing the sadness and the sorrow and the displeasure. And the Buddha is saying, you've done that enough. You've done that so much. So now that you understand that you've done that so much, now he's saying, okay, focus on getting to liberation. Focus on getting to enlightenment. This is the Buddha's way of encouraging you and showing you that it's wise to become dedicated and diligent in developing your practice because you've had so many countless rebirths in the past. If you ever happen to observe your past lives over the, this period of time in your life, you will see that there's just countless, 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 countless rebirths, so many of them. You might remember a few more clearly than others, but there's just countless, countless, countless rebirths that you've experienced, and it's time to be done with it all so that you can be done with the misery and enjoy the rest of this life with the peace and the joy, and then you won't have to experience rebirth over and over and over again. So let me know what questions you guys have on this chapter. This one's chapter 110, which is titled The Stream of Tears. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. All right, so what I'm gonna do is just end class here and remind you guys that next week, we're going to be studying chapters 111 through 120. We've only got about another maybe 40, uh, 45 chapters left in this entire book, and then we're going to be restarting a new book. So if you'd like to read those chapters either before or after class, because remember, you've got the words of the Buddha, and you've got words from me too, and I don't have time to teach every single thing that I'm teaching in the books. So a combination of the classes and the books is what's going to really help you. This is just more of a study group where it gives you the opportunity to ask any questions from the time that you've read. If you didn't read, it's okay. You can always come to class and learn whatever you're able to learn. But if you have the time to read before and or after class, this is where you're going to get the most benefit out of the Pali Canon and English study group. So next week on Saturday, we'll be in chapters 111 through 120. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we'll be in chapter... Actually, it's not even a chapter. It's titled the Frequently Asked Questions section, close of the group learning program, just another two weeks or so. And I'm going to be restarting from the very beginning. On the 17th of March, I'll be starting from the very beginning. But tomorrow in the group learning program, I'm going to be sharing the Frequently Asked Questions section, which are 11 individual frequently asked questions. And I'm going to walk you through those and help you understand them. And then on Wednesday, I'll be doing guided meditation with you guys and opening up to any and all questions that you have. This Monday, I'm going to be starting a foundation in the Path to Enlightenment course. I do this the first full week of every month, and I'm starting to live stream and open up Zoom for all the classes and all the courses at the temple. Towards the end of last year, the students had donated enough resources to allow me to um, upgrade the temple where I now have microphones and cameras and equipment to be able to live stream all the different classes that I'm doing. So every single class, every course, every retreat that I'm teaching, I'm starting to live stream everything. So you can attend live, but also if you can't attend live, they're recorded on 
Facebook and YouTube so that that way you can access them later. So you're always welcome to participate live or digest the content later after the class is over. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Chrissy, for reading. I really appreciate your help. Perhaps I'll see you guys in one of these future classes. Have a very wonderful and lovely rest of your day. Sawadee khab. Again for watching enjoy your meditation look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have thank you so much